How do you get a valuable piece of art that measures 12 foot by 8 foot out of a lorry and into Leicester Cathedral? Answer? Carefully. <laughs> Welcome to this birthday celebration. It is Pentecost Sunday, the anniversary of the church when the disciples of Jesus were inspired by the Holy Spirit to just spread the word of Christianity. And uh, if you're actually wondering what we're doing here, it just so happens that the guys here at Leicester Cathedral agree with me that every birthday celebration needs a present. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. I promise you, this is a gorgeous present, certainly worth waiting to see. And you'll have to wait a little bit longer because I'll be showing it to you later on in the programme. It's party time as churches everywhere celebrate Pentecost, the moment the church began. I join dance group Rebirth as they tell the story through dance. We meet Leicester's Indian community breathing new life into an old church. And we're in the city's cathedral for some magnificent music. What a great start to our Pentecost Songs of Praise. And here, in the city of Leicester, there's such a multicultural feel with people from all over the world settling here. And of course, bringing with them their different languages and faith. Across the road from this impressive Hindu temple is the Anglican church that was known as St. Gabriel's. Back in 2010, with dwindling numbers, the church was forced to close its doors and looked like it was destined to be sold to the developers. But they didn't reckon on the passion and commitment of Sonny George and his family. I will desist from saying that it was Sonny George who was a driving force behind opening this church. No. 
I don't believe in coincidence, but I do believe in God incidence. So I can always see the explicit hand of God in everything that happens in our lives. It was a divine design. So we used to pray to the Lord that we should get a place that we can call our own, a place that accords us a sense of belongingness. It was when Sonny met the Bishop of Leicester that he seized his opportunity. I thought, Bishop, if you could give us that closed church, he said, why that particular church? That's closed, that's up for sale. Why, why don't you uh, have some other church? I said, because of that strategic location. On, on our right, we have got uh, the largest Hindu temple called the Swaminarayan Temple. And uh, over, over there, we have the pub. And right at the back, uh, we have uh, a supermarket. So it's a thoroughfare. The Lord says to me that you'll be able to catch not only fish, but huge crocodiles there. I have that sort of feeling. So on the 10th of June, 2012, against all the odds, the church was saved and reopened as All Saints Anglican Church. It now attracts people from across the community in Leicester. So in your service, you use a lot of dance and movement? Yes, you know, uh, the Asian people are very expressive. They say, if you love someone, show it. How do you express your love for somebody? You jump with joy, you dance. So in order to show their love for the Lord, they jump and dance. I can't really sing, and dance is a better way of expressing stuff. I love every moment here. It's so colorful, it's so traditional as well, but yet it's so open. And many speak different languages, such as Hindi, Punjabi, and Urdu. Let us all say it together in whatever language we feel comfortable. South Indian languages I don't understand, but it's still, it's really nice to like, hear the different languages as well. The language has never been a barrier. And the Pentecost, when the Spirit descended upon them, they started talking in tongues which could be understood by anybody and everybody. You may not understand it 100%. Sometimes you understand only 50% of it. But still, the Holy Spirit makes it intelligible to them. I'm not here to convert anybody. I just introduce people to Jesus and then leave it with Jesus and them.
As promised earlier, the painting is now in position and artist Paul Benny is ready to reveal it to me and a group of friends from the cathedral who've come in for a sneak preview. This, now this picture here is, it's in a completely different league, isn't it? It's incredible. So I'm, I'm for the first time ever, I think I'm, I'm lost for words because it is such an incredibly compelling picture. Paul, what's it called? It's called Speaking in Tongues. I suddenly discovered that there are many stories, not only in the Bible, but in other sacred texts, that have fire as a representation of, of the Spirit, as in the Holy Spirit. But the man there touching the, the shoulder of the man with... Sheila, what was your first reaction when you saw this? How did it make you feel? Honestly, when I first saw it, I didn't like it. I didn't kind of get into it at first. I, it's taken me quite a few minutes of standing and looking and listening and thinking. And then suddenly I was in there and I was with those people and I wanted to know more about what was going on. I like the fact that you've used contemporary figures to represent the apostles. Why did you do that and who are they? It's just my mates. <laughs> <laughs> it occurred to me that the painters of historical scenes or biblical scenes in the Renaissance until uh, recently have or will have always used their friends as models. It's very interesting to see the way that you've used this sort of reflective resin effect. Mm. What were you hoping to create with that? Well, it's a technique I've used over the last year or two, and I've got more and more extravagant, and this is the, the most ambitious piece I've, I've tried. You can literally see yourself in there, can't that's you? That's right, and that's a bit of a shock to start with, because you think, oh, Shall I stand somewhere else where I can't see me? And then you realise that that is the sole purpose of it, that you're supposed to see you within that group. I like the way the, the fire seems somewhat separate from them. They're hardly aware that it's there, and I think very often we don't know when God's doing something. We need to pay more attention. But I think, as a woman, I feel that picture actually speaks to everybody, not just men. It's that moment, of, that hinge moment, really, of a turning point from... Uh, perhaps their grief and sorrow and anxiety to suddenly something new is happening. The eyes, the figures, the faces here are still coming to terms with what's going on. Some of them are quite uncertain about what's happening here, but there's a sense of momentum and energy within the painting which is deep and very real. It's bringing our experience today alive and bringing Pentecost alive with us.
This is Rebirth, a contemporary Christian dance group who've been touring the country as part of a national celebration. In a minute, these guys are going to teach me some moves. But before that, we're going to find out about the festival that celebrates Pentecost, the biggest birthday party ever. Tonight really is the celebration of Pentecost Festival. Seven years ago, Andy Frost set up the festival to put Pentecost back on the map. And today, churches across the UK are hosting parties to mark the birthday of the church. Andy, what do you mean when you say the church? What is the church? Well, the catchphrase for the Pentecost Festival has always been the church has left the building. That the church isn't actually the building, the church is me and you. And I hope that actually as we celebrate Pentecost, as we leave our buildings behind, people begin to see the church is about me and you, people, ordinary people, doing extraordinary things because God has done something in our lives. And it's about celebrating the Spirit of God and working in our lives as the people of God, as His church. I think it's really important for people to understand where the roots of their faith come from and for, for people to get involved in today's culture, for them to understand the history of their church and to understand how important it is that, that Jesus is in their daily lives is really important. Anyone can be part of it, uh, whether you're a dancer, a singer, a comedian, an actor, actress, anyone can take part, which is great, great news. And that's just what dance group Rebirth are preparing to do. So D7, how do you actually tell the story of Pentecost through dance? Basically, we keep it to the biblical um, story of it and the day of Pentecost and everything represents and how, I guess, God's spirit came down and it's enabled people to do extraordinary things. And we want to show that in a very dance element way and kind of show the strength and the skill that we all have. It's very diverse. Um, I'm from Canada myself. Uh, one of the dancers here from America and yeah, we're all from everywhere. You are creating a story through dance. What's the difference, particularly with this story? Everyone loves to dance. That's the main thing about dancing is that it's fun. But the fact that we get to dance for God and that there's a message behind what we do, I think it makes it so much more rewarding to ourselves and as a group. All right then, D7, I'm in your capable hands. Cool. I need you to teach me a little move so I can feel as if I'm part of your dance troupe. All right, cool. So, um, it's gonna go down. Five, six, seven, and ha, ha, boom. <laughs> yeah. Like <See>? it. <laughs> <laughs>
Mariam is a palliative care doctor, and as part of her job, she visits patients in their own homes. I mainly look after people with advanced, progressive, life-limiting conditions. Obviously, time is really precious, and um, you want to make it as comfortable as possible for them. Personally, I felt that it was almost a calling for me. I felt that it was God guiding me to do something that would help. Quoting Mother Teresa's words, not everyone can do great things, but we can do small things with great love and compassion. Hi, Tony. Hello, Mariam. Morning, how are you? Fine, thank you. Come on in. Today, Mariam is visiting Tony, who's been diagnosed with motor neurone disease. Would you like to actually see me eat something? That'd be great. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I actually enjoy visiting people at their homes. Um, I think it's a privilege yeah. because you're going into their space. The challenge is you don't know what's going to face you over there. Um, how much can you help? I would say it's one of the most fulfilling parts of my role. Yeah, I suppose it's, um, it's also stops you from feeling that eating is such a massive effort. Um, yeah, yeah, it makes it so much easier. Yeah. Um, I found that um, it was quite tiring sometimes to eat. Yes. And, um, I've always thought about medicine as itself, not as something that could really fix people. We all die eventually. But if we could do something to help carrying a bit of that cross for them and make even the smallest difference, is crucial for them to have some comfort and ease in their suffering, then I thought, well, that's something that would work for me. When she's not out on visits, Mariam is based at the hospice, Loros. Hi. How are you? Fine, thanks. I wouldn't dream of working in a place that's glum and gloomy. The hospice is a place where we try our best to make sure that people get as many happy moments as possible when they are here. It's a job that demands not just Mariam's medical skills, but also takes a good deal of emotional strength. Sadness does touch you frequently. I think when I get overwhelmingly sad, it's my faith that helps me cope with it. A lot of people are quite worried about offering spiritual support to a certain extent, so it's wonderful to know that we're doing it perhaps just right for you. Because I know how my faith helps me understand people who have a belief not necessarily a particular religious belief, I'm able to actually explore a bit more sensitively. And the team are just amazing. I'm getting a bit upset. It's, a, it's rather wonderful. It really is. Yeah. Well, I know that you're an inspiration for me. Oh, thank you. I believe that the Holy Spirit is within each breath. And, um, and when it's difficult to actually stop and think sometimes and you just feel it's just getting a bit much. We have to actually take that moment to take a breath in and out and think that's God's breath, that's the Holy Spirit coming in and out.
Come, Holy Spirit of God, renew us with your grace and fill us with your love, that your creation may sing of your glory. Amen. Amen. And may the Spirit of truth lead you into all truth and give you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, I hope you've been inspired by the message of Pentecost, the incredible people we've met, the stunning art, and of course, the music. I've loved being in Leicester, and Songs of Praise will be back in this great city later on in the year. But until then, we leave you with our final hymn, Breathe On Me, Breath of God.
Before we go, I have exciting news of this year's Big Sing recording at the Royal Albert Hall on Sunday, the 14th of September. We'll be singing fabulous hymns and Christmas carols. It's going to be a wonderful evening. The phone lines and box office will be open from 9am tomorrow. Please don't try calling now. The number to call is 0845 401 5022. Calls cost up to 5p a minute from most landlines. Calls from mobiles may cost considerably more. You'll find the telephone number and more information on the Songs of Praise website, bbc.co.uk slash songs of praise. If you can't make it, don't worry. You'll have a front row seat by watching on the BBC wherever you are. Next week, we celebrate fathers and fatherhood. Claire meets up with hymn writers Keith and Christine Getty, and there's also music from Matt Redman. We'll also have some great Father's Day hymns from St. Patrick's Church in Jordanstown. Town.